Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of the ESG Experience Podcast brought to you by Gobi, the ESG platform. I'm Healy Lev, Gobi's Chief Revenue Officer. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Gobi's CEO. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes in the ESG universe to understand how it can help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. Today, we are joined by a special guest, Patrick Wood Uribe, CEO at Util. Util is a fintech startup that uses machine learning to map and measure the positive and negative impacts of every listed company in the world based on the 17 UN SDG and 2000 further sustainability themes. As CEO, Patrick brings a wealth of experience at the intersection of machine learning and finance. Before joining Util, Patrick was the head of business development at Kensho, the leading provider for artificial intelligence and data analytics to sophisticated financial institutions and critical government agencies. We're excited to have you today, Patrick. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. And we're saying it properly, Util? You are, yeah. Util, Util, Util. Great. Of course. Um, I wouldn't say it wrong on a podcast with tens of thousands of listeners. It's practice. It was rehearsed. It's, I mean, you know, I, I've, I haven't heard of Util, but I spent a lot of time kind of researching and looking at the, the site and, and your background. And we've got some questions here for you today, but I'm mostly like thrilled to just, you know, however you can work in the conversation about what you guys are doing and how it works. Like, it's really cool, really cool stuff that, that you're doing over there. So appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and talk a little bit about um, ESG with us, although I understand a little bit now about how your your platform is is different than ESG and the perspective you have, and I think that was a, a really cool insight that I got. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I trust you'll be interested in sharing some of that. Absolutely, and and that's a that's a good place to start, I think. In um, at, as Healy put it, navigating the the alphabet soup of ESG, one of the things that we do here really often is the distinction between ESG as a measure of the risks on a company. So am I managing those risks? You know, am I, for instance, an oil company that takes into account the risk of an oil spill in an accurate and uh, reasonable way that sort of communicates to my investors? That's sort of one thing, but that's very, very different from the impact that that oil company has on the world around it. And so that's been when we uh, looked at what we were providing to the market, that's one of the things that we really wanted to do was to start uh, not just kind of doubling up on existing information, but bringing something new to the market, which looks at how companies affect the world around them. And that's that's the distinction that that you highlighted. Yeah, if I summarize it one more time, because I was explaining to someone earlier, am I saying it right? Like ESG and a little uh, is kind of, you know, how you perform your business and, mm -hmm. you know, you till you're looking at the actual outcomes and what is the product and what is the service and now is how is that thing impacting um, a sustainable economy, yeah. I guess. Is that that's somewhat exactly accurate? It. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. And you can sort of think of it as, as sort of the difference between, between sort of similar questions. One of them is um, for its type, is this a good company? And that tends to be, that's historically the way ESG has been. Mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. given the constraints of being this kind of thing, is this a good version of that thing? Uh, what we're doing is, is the, what we see is kind of the next question, which is, is this company selling stuff that is making the world better or worse? And that's, I think, as we especially think about the importance of managing all of that impact, understanding how we get to a place where companies are more sustainable and they actually have an impact on the world that can be positive as well. They minimize the negative impact. That's where we see the market going is, is sort of understanding like, is this company making the world better or worse as a really important question. Yeah. I like the illustrative example from your website about how ESG can have blind spots. So, you know, you say here that a, a tobacco company or a fossil fuel company can score highly in ESG just on the basis of transparency, but you're not, to your point, examining, you know, the fact that they're burning, that it's fossil fuels or that it's a tobacco company. So that is an important consideration. Um, and of course, you know, the frameworks can be subjective, which um, I think is why you chose to align with SDGs for, as the framework of consideration for util. Exactly. Yes, there there are a couple of things behind that that are really key for us. Um, 
as I, I would sort of say as, as kind of guiding principles, one of them is that we do use machine learning as a technology. So that, that's another piece of it that I'll come back to in a second. The SDGs are especially helpful as a framework because they are, first of all, they're, go they're goal oriented, which is really helpful because we don't just want to say, oh, I took one step that makes me better than I was last year, but there are still a thousand steps to go. We want to know that there are a thousand to go. We want to measure our progress <laughs> to know if we need to take 200 a week <laughs> or what, you know, what is the progress that we actually need to make? So you need to have a sense of what that is. So the SDGs are very helpful in that sense. And then the other sense they're really helpful is that they're quite holistic, which ESG, that's another one of the ESG blind spots is you might think about environmental concerns, but then what do you do if, um, you know, you, you want to take into account um, really significant global social concerns, like what do you do about poverty or hunger or uh, healthcare in developing countries? Yeah. Those are things that the SDGs are really helpful for contextualizing that, you know, we, we've uh, seen recently, in fact, that there's a huge blind spot in the way that uh, we approach, uh, particularly something like um, uh, uh, green bonds or sort of climate friendly investments. Um, we want to be in a position where we're, we're actually globally making the world better. So, so the SDGs are really helpful there. Um, and then the other piece of it is exactly as you point out, a lot of the analysis can be really subjective. So we take advantage of the fact that we can train machines. Um, and as long as we do that in a really careful way, they don't have many of the weaknesses that human beings do. So I I, I've that. used this example before. Such a great point. It's just is what it is. There's no spinning. There's no twisting. There's no greenwashing. It literally is just a robot saying it is or it isn't. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that binary type, um, you know, we end up doing lots of layers of it. So it's really accurate and it's, it's, um, it's representative of, of what we're really looking at, but it's, it's so helpful because we already know if you give, um, if you give different people different material, um, they pay attention to the most recent thing. It's like a really well-documented human failing. The recent things stand out in our minds and we think that's the most relevant and a machine just doesn't have that issue. Yeah, yeah, the recency bias, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, that's really cool. What, one more thing that I'll, I'll mention for now of many things that, that you, you're doing very well, the explainer video um like on the first you know just scroll down a little bit on your site so good like such oh, a good. Glad you like easy it. two minute way or whatever it was to to get a really great picture uh i really enjoyed it so um we're still in that realm where i guess where we must talk about covid so we've got the one the one covid question um that, that we'll talk about you know we kind of say that 2020, I guess, even with social injustice, let alone a pandemic, um, you know, some distrust in, in maybe leadership and things like that, that we've seen, it really feels like a year that shined a light on ESG or on the purpose for SDGs and that kind of stuff. Um, do you see that as a, a, a fad in that we've all kind of like focused on it and it has some energy behind it right now? or was that a proper pivot to like, this is really important and business and even, you know, day-to-day -day consumers are gonna are keep this in mind uh, for the coming decade plus. So I, I think it's more of the latter. It was funny, I was trying to think of the, the, the appropriate analogy for what, what I think has been an evolution over the year. Um, I started out thinking, wow, this is making a lot of gray things black and white. <laughs> So that was the first reaction I had. Just like, sure, sure. wow, you know, we either are going to make it through this or not. And and so that that was very clarifying. And I think it, it that happened in a lot of ways, and it happened in very personal ways for a lot of people too. Which is suddenly, the things that really matter you matter to you start to to stand out. Like, you know, the things that, you know that you really care about. The things that um, I think were already trends in the market just started to accelerate. So I think. On the one hand, the, it is definitely here to stay because it did accelerate a lot of trends that we were seeing. So in, for instance, in, in finance, the, the explosion of ESG over the past year, I think 
is itself like an acceleration of, of an existing trend that we saw in other industries, which is people start to really associate their dollars with their values. So people buy things from companies that they identify with, that they feel are doing good work. It's really important to them to identify with the brand of a company and those sorts of things. And we saw that uh, uh, starting a little bit in finance, and then it just it, it really took off with ESG over the past year. I think with markets being what they are, I think what will happen is that um, that will continue and, and much of that will remain. But I think a lot of things will also kind of fall off in the process as well. So I think we'll see a little bit of pendulum swinging uh, where, for instance, a, a lot of the energy stocks that, that performed badly last year because no one was traveling, uh, no one was really going anywhere, a lot of the activities that, that burned energy, mm. as it were, uh, weren't happening. So obviously, energy stocks underperformed, but that's no longer going to be the case this year. So those will start to perform better. And I think we'll start to see some sort of growing pains as a result of that and a little bit of um, instability. But I think the principles are really definitely here to stay. So consumers will continue to assign um, value, you know, personal values in their investments. That will continue to happen. So in a way that kind of drives everything. And now we have to make sure that we can have an effective way for those people to make those decisions uh, totally. without yeah. the greenwashing and, and all the kind of things. So Exactly. Cool. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. So I'm going to go off script for a moment, mostly because I'm wild, but also because this I need you to unpack this for me. Um, it's just an interesting concept. So again, you have you say, you know, on your website, let's say you're trying to understand Facebook's impact on mental health. And of course, there's been pressure around social media channels and how much responsibility they should have as to, you know, being catalyst for riots or mental health. Um, so interested to hear how you might do that, how you might measure and assess Facebook's impact on mental health. And then the, the other point, and then like, what do you do with that? So, you know, you say each product or each company is going to have positive and negative impacts on different sustainability concepts You capture them, but then what? So say that we determine Facebook is terrible for mental health, like then what? Is right. it, you just, is it public shaming? Is it like, how, how do you turn that into action? So th this is a really, really interesting, um, I think it's a really interesting kind of market dynamic uh, question as well. So there are several several parts to it. So some of it is is like how we do what we do at Util, but then some of it is also why we do it uh, in terms of helping investors make those decisions and what those actions really consist of. So the first piece of it is um, you know to take a company like Facebook. There are tons of them that are that are like this. And it happens really frequently where there will be, and this is again why machine learning is so awesome, there's a sense in which we focus on one thing at a time. It's very natural for humans to do this. Like this, this is, it's, it's how we've gone through the world uh, for a really long time. Um, and one of the things that makes investing in this way or trying to understand multiple impacts so complicated is because it's, it's actually there's so many interlocking parts and there's so many different things to consider. So a really, really kind of easy comeback when people are talking about the negative impacts of Facebook are, well, wait a minute, what about all of the different ways in which people are now connecting in ways that impact their social lives in a positive sense? Right. Like how do we measure that against the negative mental health impacts? How do we measure positive mental health impacts? <laughs> how do we measure, for instance, um, the economic benefits of how cheap advertising is through social networks. What about that kind of explosion in commercial activity that can happen through some of these online platforms that wouldn't happen otherwise? So that's the kind of thing that we map when we look at a company like Facebook. And I, I, I don't have it off the, the top of my head, but I know that there are multiple impacts in all of these different areas, yeah. um, including things like economic growth that will happen through these different things. So that's one side of it, which is the very reason we want um, to capture multiple impacts is so that we can understand well, what's the relative, um, I guess, how much importance do we ascribe to the thing that we're hearing about relative to these other things? Um, a really good example uh, is something like an energy company where we're always trading off economic growth and environmental uh, degradation, right? So there's, mm -hmm. we, we've like for, well, I guess if you 
if you count like all of human existence, we've burned stuff for energy <laughs> forever. So there's the mental were like, well, let's understand what we're powering with that um, and understand how we compare those things rather than just, well, energy, it, has, it either has to be clean or non-existent. So um, that's part of how we deliver the data to our clients. And then on the action side, like what do people do with this? That's the piece where um, I think we're really at a new frontier. Um, I think one of the things that's emerging now that I think was not really all that clear, or at least we, we, we sort of had a handle on it before, um, is that these, um, these actions and the kind of available set of preferences for investors is so broad and so complex that in some ways it's really hard to say for this investor, you know, for, for instance, what might be exactly the right thing for one investor is totally the wrong thing for another investor. And we sort of know this intuitively because every day in the stock market, someone is buying something that someone else is selling. <laughs> right? So yeah. there's always a difference in preferences, like billions of times a day. And so when we think about that and we think about, well, what's the data that a person in that environment needs to make the best decision? They need timely data. They need trustworthy data. They need something that they can really depend on and that's clear to them and that gives them um, some kind of realistic sense of what they're looking at. And that's what we're aiming to provide. And then with that information, investors can choose, you know, these are the particular areas that I care about the most. This is where I want to align my investments um, or, you know, the reverse. I want to, you know, short things that I think are bad or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's, that's an exciting concept to me. Um, you reminded me, uh, there's an environmentalist, a Canadian environmentalist named David Suzuki, who I really mm -hmm. like, and he wrote this book and he talked about this, this terrible industry and he wrote all the things that it did. He's like, if it, if we would have known that this was going to, this many deaths, like millions of right. deaths and this would happen and this would happen, this happened, we would undo this. And then he's like, it's the invention of the automobile. <laughs> so you yeah. know would right. you undo it or you know you, it, you're valuing the other things that it's done for humanity having this this thing you would never just stop that progress but if you look at it like this and see what all everything associated with it, you might go wow is this good or, or is this bad so i thought that was mm -hmm. pretty interesting but you mentioned um you know trying to provide that that data do you see yourselves or or anybody kind of becoming um uh or or any official um standards or is there going to be one super simple way that we're going to be able to value public companies and then could the private market use that same thing or um u.s legislation or what you're seeing in the uk is is there a clearer easier easily adaptable thing coming or does it exist in your point of view? That's a really tough one. I, I think um, my, my feeling on this is, has been similar, sort of consistent, but also somewhat evolving. Um, I think the reality is that the range of preferences for investors is so large that actually a single standard probably isn't the best thing because actually we already use different standards all the time. So as an investor, I, my rule of thumb might be a particular PE ratio relative to the peer group, but for a different investor, they may want to value that company differently and they'll use, they'll go through the whole discounted cash flow. <laughs> like there are different ways to think about value. Um, and those models exist, coexist all the time and we're totally comfortable. And so in a certain sense, it, like it doesn't make sense to me to have, well, this has to be the ESG standard because we already use multiple standards as it, as it is. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece of it. The piece that I think is really, really critical is to make sure that investors have uh, consistent, accurate, and trustworthy data. It doesn't do any good if, if investors in one part of the market have great information and somewhere else they have terrible information or they only have great information about companies of a certain size. Um, and that's another kind of principle that we've adopted at Util is, is this idea that we want to provide something that is 
consistent across all of the companies that we look at because otherwise it's not especially and it, it's useful in pockets but it's not useful across the board um, and then we want to be as inclusive as we possibly can so the first piece of that is to cover every listed company in the world uh, so that we don't leave out uh, for instance small companies in developing markets etc so that's that's a, another piece of it and then i think as you as you pointed out the the ideal scenario is to have something that at least we have a kind of common framework for uh, for different types of companies and different asset classes, even if in practice we don't have a single standard. We need a sort of common language, even if we don't all use the same words, as it were. If you level the playing field too much though, right, and you give everybody the same information, doesn't that take some of the fun out of the strategy and the arbitrage and why someone's a buyer and why someone's a seller? It's like too fair. But I'm just kidding. Well, it's the right thing to do, but that's exactly it. And well, that's one of the things where I think there's a distinction between the information that people use and then how they use it. So I, I sort of think of it as a as like a uh, a hammer which I can use to to drive a nail or I can break my thumb. Like we want to provide everyone yeah. with the hammer that's appropriate to their size of hand and arm and whatever it might be. But ultimately, there is going to be that um, judgment uh, skill. That, that kind of human component in how people use the data. But I do think there's that floor that we want to reach. And then as, as you say, the fun comes in in how you implement it. Yeah, for sure. There's still discretion and how someone's gonna unpack it or align it with their own investment thesis. It makes sense. Yeah, um, exactly. So maybe shifting gears a little bit on a different topic. So greenwashing obviously has been around for a while and that's part of what you're trying to combat is you know really holding people i'd say accountable for what their companies are doing what their businesses are doing adding the transparency making it more public and in line with that too there's regulation here in the states where the sec now has a, this uh committee it's like 30 or 40 people and there's a whistleblower hotline where you can actually actively mm -hmm. report on um greenwashing and then of course um the next iteration of that is going to be esg related litigation what is your what is your take on that? Do you think that's coming hard and fast? Is that going to be the kind of thing where as these things go happens first in Europe and then the states follow or what what are your thoughts on just um the increase in the coming years of ESG related litigation? And I think um it's interesting because I think that there is a a, a likely cultural distinction between the the EU and and the US. I think if you were to ask me, and this is totally personal speculation, so it, this is not a, not a- Yeah, I want um, your personal speculation. You're so a professor this, and you went yes. to Oxford and Princeton. So you're, you're a professional, your personal speculation is just fine. Okay, <laughs> well, so um, it, on a personal level, what I found, and also having lived in both places, this is another kind of personal aspect to this. True. The, what I think is likely is that the EU will probably lead the way in terms of regulatory structures. So there will be more regulatory guidance in the EU. Um, that's already started. They've already taken the lead. We've seen the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. There's the different parts of the EU taxonomy that's coming. So there's, there's already that that's, that's in motion. And in that sense, the US is a little bit further behind. Having said that, the, the US um, from the very beginning, um, you know, without sort of, embarking on a like an impromptu civics lesson but the legal system in the u.s has always been a way uh, uh has always been a proving ground rather than uh a way of enforcing existing laws so mm -hmm. the assumption in the u.s is that you 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 put a law in place and then you sort of litigate away all of the holes and exceptions and judgment you know all the various different judgments uh, and then eventually that that's a sort of refining process that gets you to the point where it's it's sort of commonly understood and everybody abides by it. Um, that's comparatively unusual as a perception of what the legal system is supposed to do. Uh, I think if you were to ask, uh, a, 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 well, if you were to ask me before I came to the US, I would tell you that the laws exist. If you break them, you get sued <laughs> or you go yeah. to jail and that's it. Like there's yeah, no yeah. other, I'm not trying to you know, test So elegant something. in its simplicity and <laughs> logic, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> So I think that's where we'll see probably, if I had to guess, based on those two things, I would say it's very likely that if these regulations take force, we'll see litigation in the US probably a little bit more often than in Europe for that very reason, unless there are some really kind of egregious cases in Europe that come up.
Makes sense. So, um, how are we doing? What is utils? Um, you know, I don't know. What What do you point out that you've discovered? I guess I'll tell you. I was looking around. I, I think what I was was looking at was um, all forty five thousand listed companies uh, performance across the SDGs. Uh, I flipped between, toggle between a, you know a couple different countries. Life below water seems quite concerning uh, to mm -hmm. me. I don't know. I, I, I enjoy the water and um, mm -hmm. uh, another environmentalist I follow, Paul Watson, the like um, you know, tries to save whales. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been, just really been fascinated about that. Life below water looked very concerning to me. And I, I've, his saying is, if uh, the oceans die, we die. Um, so I, I don't know. I just noticed that was like a big red bar. Am I, am I reading yeah. that properly, that that's, that's bad? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a lot of what we find um, there. I would say if I could, if I summarize the overall trends that we're seeing, um, there are a couple of that really stick out. One of them is that environmental impacts are really varied and they, they take a lot of different forms and they're almost all alarming. So we tend to think of like climate and we think of temperature as our kind of principal gauge, like mm, we're, you know, mm -hmm. The globe is getting too hot um, and we think that's about like green that's energy. All, almost all we talk about, yeah. Exactly. And then we get yeah. really focused on it and then we don't realize that there's a ton of activities that we're doing, some of them even involving sourcing the materials <laughs> that will go into providing that transition, like the minerals and, and you know all of the different metals that go into making green products. A lot of those are actually, those come with environmental negatives and so there's a, it, it's enormously complex. So that's one thing that I would, I would, I would take away from the overall data. Um, and, and it's, it's sad to say, but I think the, the, the one key takeaway is that, um, basically economic activity, uh, is bad for the environment. Like, and, and if you want to take it one step further, human beings being on this earth is, is. <laughs> Like that's a problem for the environment. So um, we have to figure out a way to a way to keep the being that that mitigates all of these these negatives because it's and and the issue really is that you know we have to do that at a pace that's realistic and that's that's not just putting a band-aid on a on a really, really kind of um, significant issue. Wow. Yeah, and I think I agree with you. I mean, just on a personal note, and I'm not a professor, um, nor did I go to Oxford or Princeton, but people just don't do anything, unfortunately, until it's smack in their face. Like we talk about this flooding, we talk about the sea levels rising, we talk about cities like Miami and Bangladesh could be underwater in our lifetime, but literally until people see like water coming under their door, they'd be like, oh, but my house has flooded, fix it. Like they, you know, and it's that's the, the frustrating or enraging thing to me, having been in the ESG space for my entire career, almost 20 years, is just the driving the behavioral change, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have like these macro level things like the Paris Climate Agreement that you hope will kind of align the world because like, yeah, we're all in it together, but you see the evidence of the coral reefs dying, all these things, it's like, we're not doing it fast enough. So it's, it is troubling um, mm -hmm. at a macro level. Uh, not to be depressing, that's usually not my vibe, but I, it is, I mean, it just is, it's scary. Yeah, you know? it really is. I the nice thing is that at, at least we, at least we're in a position where we, like, between all, or, or like among all of us, we can get this done, right? I think there's there's a there's a uh, as long as we approach it in the right way that we have the collaboration. I sort of see it as like a a kind of mega version of the space race. Like we just we have to think about it in those kind of gigantic collaborative mm. terms. Yeah. Um, and we have technologies that can help us. We have brains that can help us. Like there's, there's a ton that we can do, um, but it is, it, it, it's really alarming. And I think, you know, we have to counteract like the, my, my response, and this is, you know, honed over many years of disappointment <laughs> when I feel that kind of, um, uh, I guess, negative about where we are, the important response for me is like, well, how do we turn that into into positive action? I think there's there's a lot of good that we can get out of it, but it, in a way, you sort of have to get depressed first. Yeah, I think you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like you said, if we if everyone gets excited about 
putting a person on the moon or, you know, putting tourists into space or yeah. putting a, a human on Mars I and mean, people rally around. It's like, we're definitely going to do it. Like we're definitely yes. going to figure all those things out. So if we decide, Hey, we definitely want to save this planet and it's something that must be done. Then if you look at it at that kind of macro level, you're like, yeah, we can, we can do these outrageous kind of things. And to your point that if you look at it, binary, humans are bad for the planet or a negative impact <laughs> okay but we're agreeing well we're gonna try and solve for that because right. we want to be here so we're just gonna do it. and then the economy thing that's another interesting one i i don't like this there's some proposition that economy equals an, an environment or whatever but an economy is definitely a made-up imaginary thing and mm -hmm. a tree is a real thing so there's definitely a right. difference there i believe mm -hmm. in priority um, but we're also agreeing we are going to have some sort of society and economy. So we have to solve for being here and then having some society and then somehow, you know, make sure that, that we can be sustainable while doing that. Even though I, I guess what you're saying is right now they're just negatives. Yeah. <laughs> so that's quite the thing yeah. to, to turn around. Yeah. But, this is, these are like major philosophical issues. I was not expecting to get straight to, uh, well, <laughs> but, but it's very cool. Yeah, um, I, I saw, and I'm going to touch on this towards the end here, here in a few minutes, but um, that, that you have a PhD in philosophy as well. Is that right? Oh, actually music theory. So I, I, uh, I, I did read a lot of philosophy in doing it, but it's, uh, it's actually music theory. I thought it said philosophy on LinkedIn. No, it says mu music theory. Mm -hmm. What did I miss? Okay, well, that's awesome. I'm uh, listening to a podcast right now called um, The Soundtrack Show. And Interesting. It's this, um, it's all about uh, the music in movies. And I imagine, you know, John Williams, the like, oh, yeah. Most, yeah. And so there's a lot about him, but it's this guy who is in the industry and it's just absolutely uh, fascinating. How, the composers that make music and the storytelling that goes into the song. Like, you almost don't have to watch Indiana Jones. You could listen to the, right. to the John Williams sound and go, oh, I know what happens. There's this hero. And right. he goes on a journey and it's tough, but he's hopeful. And then he wins. Like you could just get that out of the thing. You don't have to watch the movie. That that blew my mind. But I have to plug uh, Tanasi, our colleague here, who who got me into that that podcast. But um, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Anything else, Healy? I just have one other question again, a little off script. So you've mentioned that you spent, you know, both time living in the States and time living abroad. So one of the problems going back to, I guess, the macro level philosophical um, conversation we're having is like just people's willingness or want, or, you know, maybe some of them want to do the right thing, but they don't like tactically know what to do. It's like, I recycle, what else should I do? I, I walk when I can. But then there's the whole, like, at least in the U.S., we have the subculture of the people that just don't think that this is a problem, right? They think it's just a hoax and that global warming isn't real and that climate change doesn't matter and it's all cyclical and it's all just, do you, is that, are there people like that in, in Europe too or do most folks, and I know it's a very broad generalization, but do you have, you know, a subculture of those folks that are really just still denying climate change or denying that this is a problem? My impression is that, that, um, there are um, there are those people everywhere. Um, that's my my impression from from what I from what I've read, um, and I think it's it's really tricky. And I think when I when I do think about that um, kind of predicament, um, it actually reminds me of a of a, a range of different um, I guess similar encounters where. Um, it's much more of a kind of tribal or cultural, uh, I guess, confrontation. And that's where we see just increasing polarization overall. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's the sort of trend that we're seeing. I have no idea how to counteract it. Um, but I feel like if you were to ask me, I don't know, 10 years ago, how strongly held those opinions were, yeah. I think it's probably way less strongly than they are today. And so I, I think there is a kind of, you know, Shift. polarizing. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is, uh, which is concerning. Um, and I guess, you know, that's also part of the challenge of, of how we try and, uh, how we try and fix all of this.
Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely part of the challenge. Um, you know, to your to the analogy of putting a a person on the moon or space travel, like everyone thinks that's cool you know, for the mm -hmm. most part. I think anyone's right. going to argue that it would be cool to explore space. Um, but yeah, this is different. Yeah. So. Well, I think just on that point, one of the things that that has really struck me about um, something like you know the the space race or the International Space Station is probably an even better example. Is like when you think about all of the different things that need to happen in order for that space station to exist. There's the technology that keeps it going. They're the people who operate all of the instruments that do it. They're the astronauts that go up there. There are the people who build the rockets that get them to the space yeah, station. Yeah. They're the people who design the trajectories. There's the scientists who design the materials for you know X, Y, and, and Z in the first. It's just for a relatively small space uh physically that is orbiting the earth it's a massive number of people that have been involved yeah. and i sort of feel like that's how we need to think of it um in terms of uh approaching you know our, our own kind of sustainable future are we sure that there actually is a space station <laughs> up there <laughs> Um, no, the, the idea that like, yeah, we're dropping people off at a space station and picking them up. It's like, oh, what are you doing today? I'm going to, to pick someone up from the space station and right. bring them back or whatever. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's like, wild. are you asking Patrick if he's been there? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I mean, I was, you know, an homage to the <laughs> person on the moon situation. Yeah. Um, do we really have someone up there? Uh, no, we must. Um, well. I really appreciate all that uh, deep conversation and uh, philosophical as some of it was. Uh, that brings me to uh, lighten it up a little bit with uh, a game we play here every time, uh, if you don't mind, uh, people Oops. enjoy very much. It's very simple. Um, in the world of uh, artisan and, and craft concepts, um, we're going to all you have to do is tell me if, if the thing I tell you is is beans or beer. It's either beer or beans. OK, craft beer or beans. Okay. It's all you got to say. And in the light of, of philosophy, I'm going to change it. I'm not going to actually say the name of the either coffee or beer brewery. I'm going to say one of their products. Okay. And actually, then I'm going to go look to see if they're listed and try and see how well they're doing. <laughs> nice. um, probably not because they're craft. It's called, um, this product is called Three Philosophers. I'm going to say beer. beer. You're correct. That is a beer. Ooh, well done. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's a cool little craft brewery. Another one of theirs is uh, they have a whole Game of Thrones uh, set of beers. They have oh, a whole fun. philosopher's set of beers. They have a whole thing, but they're called Oma Gang, and they're in Cooperstown, New York. But they're mostly um, uh, Belgian beers. Uh, so, well done, Very cool. sir. Thanks Very well so much. Done. <laughs> All right. Anything well... else, Celia? I think that brings us to uh, to a wrap here. It does. I was just waiting for a long enough pause to indicate that you were definitely done with the game. The game is over. The game Patrick is won. <laughs> the okay. game is over. The game is over. So thank you guys, uh, everyone, for joining us on the ESG Experience podcast. And thank you again to our guest, Patrick. This was um, exciting and, and fun to do with you. Um, our next episode, we're going to focus on the concept uh, within the built environment of ESG from build to boardroom and how we move the, the needle there. Um, Thank you to our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and support our podcast. And if you want to continue the conversation between episodes, do follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience.